you take a carriage ride out to Concord, I'm sure you'll learn a lot more about uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and that so-called shot heard around the world. But of course, here at the Old North Church, we're uh, more associated with another poem, one of mine. Uh, anybody heard of The Landlord's Tale? That's a trick question. Uh, Paul Revere's Ride is also called The Landlord's Tale because it was the first poem in a, a book of poems called Tales from the Wayside Inn. It's about an inn out in Sudbury, Massachusetts where travelers would gather and tell stories and Paul Revere's Ride was the story that uh, the landlord told. And that one, anybody know how that's, that poem begins? I know you know. No? Listen children, listen, children, and you shall hear the midnight go. ride of Paul Revere. I just you read want it to in there. It? <laughs> no, I just read it in there. That's it was unfair. <laughs> well, let me uh, let me see how far I can. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in '75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day in year. He said to his friend, "If the British march by land or sea from the town tonight." Hang a lantern aloft from the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land, and two if by sea. And I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm to every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Then he said good night, and with muffled oar silently rode to the Charlestown shore, just as the moon rose over the bay where Swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar, and a huge black hulk that was magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Meanwhile, his friend, through alley and street, wanders and watches with eager ears, till in the silence around him, he hears the muster of men at the barrack door, the sound of arms and the tramp of feet, and the measured tread of the grenadiers marching down to their boats on the shore. Then he climbs the tower of the old North Church, up the wooden stairs with stealthy tread, to the belfry chamber overhead, and startled the pigeons from their perch on the somber rafters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade. Up the trembling ladder, steep and tall, to the highest window in the wall where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town and the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath, in the churchyard, lay the dead. In their night encampment on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still that he could hear like a sentinel's tread the watchful night wind as it went creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place, and the hour, and the secret dread of the lonely chamber, and the dead. For suddenly, all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away, where the river widens to meet the bay. A line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide, like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride on the opposite shore, walked Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side, now he gazed at the landscape far and near, then impetuous, stanked the earth, and turned and tightened his saddle girth. But mostly, he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old North Church as it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still. And lo, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer and then a gleam of light, he springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns but lingers and gazes till full on his sight a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of hoofs on a village street, a shape in the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath, from the pebbles in passing, a spark struck out by a steed flying fearless and fleet. That was all. And yet, through the gloom and the light, the fate of a nation was riding there. And that spark struck out by that steed in his flight 
kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and mounted the steep, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic meeting the ocean tides. And under the alders that skirt its edge, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford Town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog, and he felt the damp of the river fog that rises after the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, blank and bare, gazed at him with a spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to the bridge at Conquer Town. He heard the bleating of the flock and the twitter of birds among the trees, and he felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadows brown. And Juan was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall, who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball. You know the rest. In the books you have read how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them ball for ball from behind each fence and farmyard wall chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again under the trees at the turn of the road, only pausing to fire and load. So through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, <laughs> and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will wake and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of Paul Revere. <laughs>